The Bull Simons Award, named after the legendary Colonel Arthur Bull Simons, is presented annually by U.S. Special Operations Command as a Lifetime Achievement Award to those who embody the spirit, values, and skills of the Special Operations Warrior. We honor a man who for more than five decades, in uniform and out, has set the mark for Special Operations Warriors. He served with deep reconnaissance teams in Vietnam, was instrumental in establishing the National Mission Forces Assessment and Selection Process and the Operator Training Course, and served as Senior Enlisted Leader at all levels of Special Operations Forces. Command Sergeant Major Mel Wick. We have learned that a terrible and a brutal cost that retreat does not bring safety and weakness does not bring peace and it is this lesson that has brought us to Vietnam I mean I, I grew up in Montana country boy you know my dad served in World War II uh, two of my older brothers uh, were in the army and my uncles were in Korea, so all the protests and all the anti-American things that were going on definitely strengthened my desire to go in and, and try and make a difference. And then when I was in the eighth grade at a summer camp meeting, when I saw the Special Forces A-Team recruiter and the A-Team walk-on, that, that clinched it where I wanted to go. I went through basic at Fort Lewis, Washington, and then I went to Fort Gordon, Georgia, and uh, that's where I went to Airborne Infantry AIT. Uh, when I graduated AIT then, I got orders to go to airborne school and then to uh, report into Fort Bragg for Special Forces training. I mean, you gotta remember, I was straight off the, out of the hills in Montana and I had never done any traveling. I mean, I was pretty naive and I'm kinda thinking, man, what did I get myself into? And uh, then we started the training and it was, fascinating. Some folks were complaining about it being too hard. I was having fun because I just never got to do all these exciting things, you know, like shooting guns and rappelling and climbing rocks and moving through the woods. I mean, physically it was a little bit of a challenge, but not much because I was used to working on the farm all the time. I got through all three phases and uh, reported into third group, which is the first assignment I had in Special Forces. I wanted to go to Vietnam. Uh, so I re-enlisted, but the only place I could go was Okinawa. And uh, I was there about 19 months, and then I, I got the orders to go to Vietnam. And uh, I reported in country. Uh, I got to Nha Trang, where the headquarters was at, and then the next day I got on a C-130 and flew to Da Nang, and that's where I started uh, with CCN. It's been 50 years. We were both assigned to Command and Control North CCN when 5th Group had left Vietnam. That was in the very late part of 1971 and the early part of 72, right up until the time that uh, the unit was deactivated, whereupon Mel uh, went on to FANC, which was a, a program to train Cambodians. So he remained in Vietnam uh, while, or, or subsequent to the unit closing down. So I was assigned to 46th Company in Thailand when I first met Mel back in 1974 and Mel was down in the scuba team. And we really, really didn't have a lot of communication together when I first met him, but I, I certainly remembered him when I saw him for the second time at selection in, at Fort Bragg. I believe the, the reason Colonel Beckwith chose Mel was because he was a very serious soldier and he always did the utmost to accomplish the mission, regardless of how long it took or what it took to take to accomplish that mission. He was mission focused all the time. Actually, I heard of Mel Wick before I ever met him, but when uh, Colonel Beckwith finally got authority to establish the Delta Force. He said, make sure you get Mel Wick. After the first selection course that we did in uh, November 1977, there was a young captain from PERSCOM that showed up to go through the course. And his name was Peter Schumacher. And we were all kind of giggling behind our hands. How's this PERSCOM sergeant mate, or this PERSCOM captain going to ever make it through our course uh, and boy were we wrong and then later on all together we spent uh, seven tours and 21 years together as as commander and senior enlisted and he's uh, 
smartest man and the best general I've ever seen. Just about Christmas time of 78, I'd been in the troop about a year, uh, I got a call to go up front and see Beckwith. And, uh, you know, which which never was a good thing. And he said, I just fired out Rizzi from S&T. He was the S&T commander. He said, you're the new guy. He said, I want you to move selection to West Virginia and make him like it. So that was really the first time that Mel and I as a team, uh, you know, and I have to tell you that, you know, through the other experiences as teammates, as command team, you know, we got to where we literally didn't have to talk much to each other. I mean, we were simpatico from the standpoint of almost, you know, communicating without having to speak. He didn't require much direction, and uh, he didn't come to me with problems he couldn't solve. Um, so that's the kind of individual we were looking for uh, in the unit. And, uh, you know, he's tougher to woodpecker lips, both physically and mentally. What the general officers and Pentagon planners wanted was to have this force trained quickly and stood up so we could respond to, to terrorist acts at that time uh, around the world. And Beckwith stuck to his guns, Mel stuck to the standard in selection, and uh, the result is we ended up with the essence of the Delta Force, and that is the finest collection of non-commissioned officers ever assembled on the planet. In November 1979, we were going through an evaluation process and we were on the final exercise uh, down in Florida when uh, we got the phone call about the embassy being overrun in Iran. Eagle Claw was a very important formative experience. You know, JSOC was created out of Eagle Claw. Uh, that was one of those missions that was uh, above and beyond what, you know, anybody envisioned, you know, having to go that far. And, and, uh, you know, into a city and take down a 27-acre compound and tr trying to find people who didn't know where they were for sure and, you know, and then get back out of there safely. I mean, that is a big mouthful. And the problem, the problem is we rehearsed the heck out of how we were going to do that, but the problem was the transportation in and out. That, that was the long pole in the tent and ended up being the failure point. Mel was on the plane that ended up in the collision. He was in the fire. And so when they came out of the fire, Mel was one of the guys that got on my airplane. And, uh, you know, I kept him on there. And he came out with me. Mel Wick's legacy is, is one of, of, of loyalty, dedication, and commitment to special operations. It really, it, it really distills down to that. And somebody that is willing to work tirelessly uh, toward that end. And uh, Mel has always played an enormous role in, in uh, shaping special operations into the premier fighting force it is today. Mel Wick was the main individual that brought Task Force Ranger back to combat effectiveness in a matter of hours. When Mel Wick spoke, everybody, regardless of their rank, paid attention. One of the challenges, but also one of the great blessings I had was was being fortunate enough to be in senior leadership positions, you know, for a fairly long time. And it really started from my Vietnam days when, you know, I had a team of mountain yards. And then I had a company and then a battalion of Cambodians. I had a Thai ranger school, a scuba school. And I was involved in starting up the organization and, and setting the foundation and the you know, the philosophy for how that whole thing would go. So each step up kind of offered different challenges, but it was basically the same thing. And it, it just gets back to, you know, basic common sense and basic leadership. You, you have to establish trust with the people that you're leading. You have to be consistent. You have to stay calm. You have to stay focused. It can be trying at times, but with the quality of people throughout SOF, not just the unit, but all the different services involved, you got really good people, and they want to do good. They want to do what's right. Uh, so sometimes you got to just remind them what's right. <laughs>